Thank you. I'm really blessed to see so many of you. I, I want to weep. I'm so blessed that um, there is a hunger for God's word in this church. And uh, even the children. Uh, you children, you're taking it a lot more seriously than I did when I was your age. I want you to know that. And um, you have a responsibility, children and young people, to stand on the shoulders of us who are older than you. And so you can see farther. Now, I hope you won't overtake me spiritually because I'm not slowing down. <laughs> but God will probably be able to do more through you than he is through us. Because each of us is standing on the shoulders of those who have gone before. So take it to heart. God has a purpose for your life. Children, we sang about it. And it begins. And that's why this was the first memory verse of the year. The Lord your God is in your midst. Now midst may be a big word, children. But just remember, if you're in school, God is there with you. If you, are, if you, want, if you allow him to be. If you're at home eating a meal, God is there at your table. If you allow him to be. If you're at night, at night and you're in your bed, fast asleep and lonely and, and, and afraid because of a bad dream you had. The Lord your God is in your midst. And he's here right now. I believe it with all my heart because we have made room for him. We've repented of every sin. We've set right everything that needs to be set right. Nobody has anything against us. If so, if we have not done it or we've repented of everything wrong, God is here. We have a clear conscience towards him. But what is that like? Is it stained glass and the organ music, things like that? I don't read that in the scripture. It might be. But I'll tell you what I read in the scripture. Yes! The Lord your God is in your midst. And he is exulting over you with joy. And then he gets quiet. He's like, okay, I'm done rejoicing for a while. I got to plan some new goodness to pour into my daughter, into my son. Let me, let me think about it for a while. And then you walk through a period of darkness. And you can't hear God's voice. He's silent because he loves you. You know that? And he's, now, he's using picture words to relate to us. So that when things get dark and lonely and quiet, you will be assured that it is a sign of his love. He loves you so much that he is keeping quiet. You know, that's what that verse means. He loves you so much that he's keeping quiet. And he's got a purpose. And then when he's made those plans... He comes back and says, yes, rejoices over you. You see how sandwiched between the exulting and the rejoicing is a period of silence. And I don't know where you are today, my dear brother, dear sister, dear child. Are you in the exulting or the rejoicing? Or maybe you're in the quiet and you're feeling lost. I was there a few months ago. I'm thankful that I'm now again in the rejoicing. <laughs> and those, those cycles come and go because of our soul. In heaven, it'll be all the same. We will be with him. We will see him. We will be like him. Oh, hallelujah, what a wonderful day. It's coming soon. But we who have this hope fixed on us, purify ourselves as he is pure, First John 3 says, so that when those times of quietness come in and I'm starting to doubt, and the devil uses the fact that I can't hear him rejoicing and exulting to sow seeds of doubt and anxiety and fear. I say, no, he loves me. In his love, he is silent for me. Let's start the year this way. <laughs> and what a wonderful year you'll have. The devil will have no room in your life. Don't let him have room. Oh, don't let him have room. The true word of faith. There is a version of Christianity that's going around Christendom today. It's been called the word of faith because they use that phrase a lot. And it's very important for us to know what is faith and what is the word of faith. Let's turn to Matthew 21. The true word of faith. Matthew 21 verse 18 
We looked earlier at how Jesus chased out the money changers and then the children we read in the previous verses were singing to him. The blind and the lame came to him and were healed. Wonderful things were happening. So much so that the children led the praise. You, are, you, are you dreaming of that day, church, when God will do such wonderful things that the children will come up and say, hey, hold on, Santosh, Megan, Heidi, David. We're going to lead the praise. God has done some wonderful things for us this last week. We want to lead the praise. Oh, I'm, I'm praying for that, children. And if the Lord's done it, come, get me out of here and you, you lead the praise. That's what happened when Jesus showed up in the church. And Jesus said, out of the mounts of infants and nursing babes, you have prepared praise for yourself. Let's pray that this will happen. Verse 18, Matthew 21, verse 18. Now in the morning when he was returning to the city, he became hungry. Do you know that Jesus comes to you sometimes on a Tuesday hungry? through his Holy Spirit. He's like, I want to see some fruit in your life today. I'm going to allow you to go through a test. I'm going to allow you to go through something difficult because I'm hungry. I desire to see fruit in your life. As we sing in that hymn, Burn Fire of God, I want to see looking deep into your life, mirrored as in pure silver, my reflection there. That's what the fruit means. Jesus came, and this, this story is recorded here as a picture of Jesus coming to us through the week, hungry. He became hungry, seeing a lone fig tree by the road, seeing Santosh by himself, lonely, at his workplace, in his work desk, or on his way to his job site, or at his job site, by himself, by herself, washing the dishes, or putting the little child to sleep or cleaning the house or whatever it might be. Seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it except leaves only. No fruit. Leaves won't satisfy hunger. Fruit will, but leaves won't. Leaves give an appearance of a tree that's full of life. But the fruit is not there found nothing on it except leaves only. And he said to this tree, no longer. He was so disappointed. Now this is the same Jesus who could spend 40 days and 40 nights, like you read in Matthew 4, going without food. It wasn't his physical appetite that was let down by the tree that had leaves but no fruit. It was his spiritual appetite. He looked into the future. He looked at the people of God around him, the people whom God loved so much. And as he saw Caiaphas and Annas and others, he said, these are just leaves. They've got the language. They've got the meetings. But I don't see fruit. Inside they're full of dead men's bones. So he said, no longer shall there ever be any fruit from you. And at once the fig tree withered. Now in Mark's recount of it, we read that it was apparently the next day. Whichever it was, it happened miraculously. A tree that was fine until Jesus showed up, got exposed and withered away. And I believe, my dear brothers and sisters, my dear church family, this must be the ministry of the church. I want to pause there for a moment and show you a verse in Luke chapter 1 that's been burning on my heart. I desire this with all of my heart. Sorry, Luke chapter 2. That our church will have this ministry. Luke chapter 2, we read about Simeon. Luke 2 verse 25, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, a godly man. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, a godly, God-fearing man. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. I mean, he, he got the best you could get under the old covenant. The Holy Spirit couldn't come and dwell within anyone until the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. But the Holy Spirit could come upon certain people like he did with many, David, Moses, Samson even, sinful men. It came upon Simeon, this godly man. And through the Holy Spirit that was upon him, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. 
And that phrase has become the burden of my heart. Lord, I don't want to die until I have seen the Lord's Christ, the body of Christ on earth, the true church of the living God. Not a scattered groups of people who say they love God and say they love each other, but a body, a united living body. I don't care if it's small, but it's a body. It's united. This is the prayer of my heart. Will you join me in this prayer, church? That before you die, you will experience the Lord's Christ, the body of Christ in a living way. And he came in the spirit into the temple. Let's come every Sunday or every Wednesday, every Friday, every Saturday, whenever we meet. Lord, show me your Christ in your church. And he came into the, in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents, that's Joseph and Mary, brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then Simeon took Jesus into his arms and blessed God. And the Holy Spirit spoke to him somehow. This is it. It's small. I mean, I don't know what Simeon was expecting. Somebody like David, reigning triumphant. But here was this little baby. Few, I don't know how old he was. Just a few, eight days, really what it was. Have you seen an eight-day-old baby? I mean, helpless. Jesus was as helpless and dependent on his father and mother as every other child at the age of eight days is. And yes, I believe with all my heart, he had dirty diapers. I don't know what they had in those days, but he did. Because he had to be made like us in all things in order to become a perfect way, a perfect salvation, a perfect remediation for us. And there was Simeon holding this baby, and I don't know what it looked like, whether there was slobber and maybe the diaper was dirty. I don't know what it looked like, but it looked like every eight-day-old baby. That I know. And holding it in its innocence and in its simplicity and it, in its humanity. Simeon said, now the Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace. I can go home now. He was an old man. But he had waited for this day every day. He went to the temple and said, Lord, I want to see your body. I want to see you. I want to see you. I want to see you. And he didn't give up until the Lord said, here it is. It looks... It looks unimpressive. They're not going to write biographies about it. They'll write about David has slain his ten thousands. But this little eight-day-old baby, what is he good for? And so is the church of Jesus Christ, hidden like a diamond in the rough. Don't miss it. Don't miss it because you're looking for something fancy, something snazzy, something jazzy that's explosive. Now... Lord, you're releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And his father and mother, Jesus' father and mother, were amazed at the things which were being said about him. And Simeon blessed them through whom the body of Christ was formed. Listen to this. Simeon blessed them through whom the body of Christ was formed. That's you and I, a picture of what God would be speaking prophetically to you and I with this word of prophecy. And said to them, verse 34, Behold, this child, this church that God is building in this place is appointed for the fall and rise of many and for a sign to be opposed. And a sword will pierce you, Mary. A sword will pierce you, Joseph. A sword will pierce you if you commit yourself to building the church. Even your own soul. It'll hurt emotionally. Your heart will break, Mary. Your heart will break, child of God, if you are committed to building the church. A sword will pierce even your own soul to the end. The result of that will be that the thoughts from many hearts will be revealed. And I pray that until the time Jesus comes, if it is his will, that the Lord preserves in this place, River of Life Christian Fellowship, or whatever name they're called, a pure testimony of a few, a band of men and women who are on fire for God, who are determined that even if it pierces their own soul, they will allow the body of Christ to be formed through them. 
so that the thoughts of many will be revealed. That people will come into this place and what was hidden deep in their hearts will eventually be revealed. I don't care if it takes one day, ten days, one year or ten years. I pray that God will reveal the thoughts and intentions of our hearts and free us from all hypocrisy, from all false holiness, and make us a people that's pure in his eyes. He's going to do it, my brothers and sisters, because that's the desire of our hearts. That's the desire of us elders. I want you to know that. Ajay, Olu, and I. We're committed to that, and I believe it's the desire of every one of you sitting here. Let's preserve that pure testimony. That the thoughts and motives of hearts will be revealed because God is in our midst. I want to show you one more verse. 1 Corinthians 14. Many, many churches, perhaps every church at this very moment is saying, Lord, I thank you that you are in our midst. And I believe that the mark that God is in our midst is very clear in scripture. We read it in Luke chapter 2 and, he's, and I want to show it to you again. The mark that God is in our midst is not that everybody speaks in tongues. Some churches will tell you that. The mark that God is in our midst is not that you'll see dead raised to life or miracles performed. I pray that God does that if it is his will. I'm very much in favor of that. And if the Lord gives you the gift of tongues, by all means speak in tongues. I do, privately. And I use it to glorify God. But that's not the mark of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Here's the mark of God's presence in our midst. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 23. If you go into a church and everybody is speaking in tongues, you know what you ought to say? This is crazy. <laughs> That's exactly what's written in God's word. Verse 23. If the whole church assembles together and all speak in tongues, and ungifted men or unbelievers walk in, to whom we should be a light, they will not say, will they not say that you are mad? This is not the Holy Spirit church. This is the mad church. Bible. But if all prophesy, they during the time of sharing their camp, they've got a word burning on it. And it's not a lecture, it's not 10 minutes, it's 30 seconds of prophecy. And it's lit on fire by the fire of God, by on, on men and women who've been walking faithfully with him Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and the word is burning on their tongues, and they come here, and the word of prophecy is on their lips. If all prophesy and the unbeliever and the ungifted man says, man, they're talking about stuff that I'm dealing with and I don't know any of these people. They're speaking in English and they're speaking about the very issue that I'm facing. They're speaking about my marriage and my wife's not even here. They're speaking about my addictions and my bondages that they don't know anything about. My wife doesn't even know that. He enters... And he is convicted by all, one by one. The thoughts and motives of his heart or her heart are being revealed. And they're like, have they been watching me? Have they been spying on me? Do they know my computer history that they know where I've been yesterday? He is convicted by all. He is called into account by all. Not condemned. Not given hopelessness. But given hope convicted his his inner guts are laid open they says listen we can heal this cancer we know about it we've been there too and jesus has healed us from those things and he can do the same for you brother sister friend he is convicted by all and he's called into account by all the secrets of his hearts are disclosed see demon possessed people sat in the synagogues of the pharisees for years untouched and then Jesus showed up and they got restless. They're like, uh-oh, this is real power. And they started to manifest themselves in some way. And Jesus rebuked the devil with a word, the, the demon with a word, and they left. And the man stayed, I believe, and wanted to follow Jesus and said, Jesus, you've set me free now. I want to follow you. He says, go tell others now. Well, he, sometimes he said, don't tell others. But other times he said, follow me if Jesus has set you free. The secrets of his hearts are disclosed. And this ungifted, unbeliever, perhaps demon-possessed person falls on his face and worships God, whom he doesn't know yet, declaring, God is here. A victorious warrior, exulting over you with joy, quiet in his love, rejoicing over you with shouts of joy. Do you want this church? 
Do you want this? Oh, I burn for it with all my heart, more and more. I'm not trying to stir you emotionally because that'll die by the time I'm done speaking. But I pray that the Holy Spirit will fall upon us and, and meet with us in such a deep way that these, these trivial things will fall away. These trivial things that captivate us. I thought I would end. Maybe I should keep going. Okay, back in Matthew 21. Matthew 21. Actually, let's turn to Mark. Uh, Mark chapter 11. We read the same account. Mark 11. Verse 12. When they had left Bethany, he became hungry. And seeing at a distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to find to it, he found nothing but leaves. For it was not the season for figs. Now, it, let's not blame the fig tree, but there's a spiritual principle here that we should look at. It was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat, from, eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. Verse 19, Mark 11, verse 19. When evening came, they went out of the city. And as they were passing by in the morning on their way back to the city, they saw the same fig tree withered from the roots up. Being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. It's a miracle. And Jesus answered, saying to them, Have faith in God. Peter there are fig trees in your life that you must have faith that I can speak, that you can speak into your life through the power of the Holy Spirit and it will wither. James, there are fig trees in your life. John, there are fig trees in your life. Santosh, there are fig trees in your life. Child of God, he speaks to you today. There are fig trees in your life. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain that's in your way, that mountain of addiction, that mountain of those bad habits, that mountain of lack of control over your tongue, that mountain of the love of money, that mountain of unbelief, that mountain of fear, that mountain of anxiety, that mountain of jealousy, that mountain of, you put it there, whatever it is, that is a mountain in your life. I say to you that if you say to this, not Jesus, Jesus has already, God has already condemned sin in the flesh through Jesus. But you must speak in faith now. Whoever, put your name there, says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says, look who's speaking. Is it God speaking? It's not. Because God has already spoken. He said it. He asks you to add his amen to it like we saw last week. Now he wants you to speak what he has already spoken to you. Confess it with your mouth. That is the gift of prophecy. Whatever you have said is going to happen. If you do that, it will be granted to you. Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask Believe that you have received them and they will be granted to you. This is the favored verse of the people of the word of faith. Verse 24, taken out of context. I prayed and God gave me a billion dollar jet. The reason you don't have it, brother, sisters, is because you don't have enough faith. The lie of the devil. Oh, I'm not thinking of anyone in particular. I have no judgment against anyone except Satan and his hosts and, and his spirit that is moving among so-called Christians, even today, deceiving well-meaning Christians, sadly. Therefore I say to you, no, Jesus actually said it. These words are in the Bible. And you must know what Jesus meant if you're not to fall for the lie of the devil. Because the devil is in the business of taking God's word and deceiving people through it, not his word. There is no devil's Bible, do you know? The devil's Bible is God's word twisted to your benefit. That's the devil's Bible. Textually, it looks exactly the same like God's word. But self promoted through it. I can get more. This is the devil's Bible. 
Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, I believe, believe that you have received them and they will be granted you. Whenever you stand praying, he goes on to say, verse 25, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgression. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgression. So what did Jesus mean when he said, when he came to this fig tree, knowing that it was not the season for figs, he saw a tree that was full of leaves but not bearing fruit. It means this, be ready. For us, there is no off season to bear fruit. You're not called to bear fruit only when we're around each other, only when you're around people. And I want to add one more thing, and this is what the Lord's been impressing on my heart since he laid it on our hearts on Wednesday. The time to bear fruit is not, and the time to prepare for bearing fruit is not just when you're being tempted. So be ready at all times because the fruit may be required when you least expect it. Why did Jesus describe his coming? His second coming, yes. But his coming into our lives, Jesus' way of coming is when you least expect it. He's like the guest that shows up when you're, you know, if you ever had a guest like that, maybe it's a close relative or a friend, they can show up when you're not expecting it because they feel that comfortable with you. They just show up. Didn't send you a text or give you a call. Just showed up at the door, rang the doorbell. Actually, they didn't even rang the doorbell. They just walked in. I hope Jesus is as comfortable with your heart that he can just walk in. And you know, oh, Jesus, should have rung the doorbell first because I got to take care of the situation. I just got done with some bitterness in my heart towards my wife or my spouse. Can you let me take care of that first? Now, if you're there, if Jesus is a doorbell ringer in your life or somebody who has to send a text in advance, or you have to make an appointment with him on Sunday morning. He longs to dwell with you. To be in your midst a victorious warrior. Exulting over you 24-7, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, until you die. He wants this life with you. So, be ready at all times because the fruit may be required when you least expect it. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 3. So what does the fig leaves represent? The fig leaves represent our attempts, because I'm not bearing fruit all the time, our attempts to appear spiritually alive. So from a distance, don't come near, but from a distance, hey, there's a tree. Look at what a blossoming tree. Now that other fig tree that's all barren and withered, thank God that I'm not like that. I look like a tree that's in full bloom. Attempts to appear spiritually alive to others despite the death within us. How do we do that? Now I've shown you this verse in Genesis 3. After Adam and Eve sinned, it says that God permitted them to eat of all the trees and especially the tree of life, if you will, but forbid them from eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because he said, when you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, something will happen inside you, Adam. Something will happen inside you, Eve. Something will happen inside of you, Santosh. What is that? You will. Oh, come on. You will die. Death will come in. And so what happened when the moment, the moment Adam and Eve ate out of that tree, that very second, they didn't keel over and die physically. That death came in so much so that they recognized it. And they had to cover that death. Shame. Their nakedness was a shame to them because of their death. And so what did they do? Verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. That's a picture of death happening. And they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. I got to cover up this death that's in here. So fig leaves are always a picture of death where there is no fruit. Death where there is no life. The appearance of life where there is no life inside. That's fig leaves. And so when Jesus saw this fig leaf as it were, he was, I think, reminding us of what happened, how this all began. Why did our problems in life start? It's because we chose to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we chose to cover it up with fig leaves, looking like everything's okay. How do we do that today? We're not actually wearing fig leaves. I don't see any fig leaves on your shirts. But what do we do? We put plastic smiles on. When I see you, even though there's jealousy and bitterness in my heart, I'll smile at you. 
I'll smile at you for years if that's what it takes. And I'll be nice to you. I'll invite you to my house and I'll let you invite me to your house and I'll, uh, I'll sing and I'll talk about love and unity, but deep down it's death. It's just fig leaves. There's no fruit. Give it time. When you try to eat off that fruit, you'll find that there's nothing there. It's plastic. It's like a fig tree with leaves and a bunch of plastic fruit hanging off of it. In your marriage, if a little bit of a bitterness creeps in towards your spouse, and all of a sudden, she can sense it. Oh, you're, you're still nice to her. You still sleep in the same bed. You still hold hands with her when you're uh, walking down the street or in the car, but death is inside. And if you know it's there, dear, dear brother, dear sister, deal with it. That death will one day be manifest because God is in our midst. And he will manifest it for your own good. Because if not, he's going to manifest it at the judgment seat of Christ when it's too late to do anything about it. And I pray that he manifests death in my life, death in my marriage, death in my family, or death in this church, where the only option is to truly die with him and come to life in him or leave. That's the mark that God is in our midst. Religious language. We'll speak the words that everybody else speaks that at RLCF because that's the RLCF talk. And we'll say, we'll sound just like everybody else and we'll sit downstairs at the meals just like everybody else. But death is working a spiritual death. Inauthentic niceness. Is, I already talked about that. So, what shall we do then? How shall we ensure that this true life comes within? There's a verse in Galatians 6 verse 8 that says that if you sow after the flesh, you will reap after the flesh. But if you sow after the spirit... You will reap after the Spirit. But you know that it's too late to sow when it's time to bear fruit. You know, in the summertime, when, the, when, they're, when they're harvesting the, or in the late summer, when they're harvesting the fruit or the corn or whatever, all of a sudden, if one farmer wakes up and says, Oh man, it's August. I should be reaping. Time to sow. Too late. Too late. And you know that for years, I would find myself in a moment of temptation thinking, Man, I need to read God's word. I need to pray. I need, I'm getting frantic because the temptation is coming upon me and I can't handle it. And I fell. And the devil had his way with me. Because I wanted to sow something. I wanted an instant, you know, two-minute noodles, as it were. They have these two-minute noodles, right? God's fruit is not two-minute noodles because that stuff's not healthy for you. Even though I love it, ask my wife. She, you know, we've, we've gotten rid of it in our house. But I miss those days when I was a bachelor and lived off of two-minute noodles. But God is not a two-minute noodle giver. <laughs> the fruit that he wants to bring forth in your life will take a while. And the secret to that, my dear brothers and sisters, if you want to bear fruit in the moment of temptation. Now, if you find yourself in the moment of temptation and you haven't been sowing because you were lazy, do one thing. Run to the throne of grace. Hebrews 4, the end of that, that last verse says, We can still run boldly to the throne of grace for help in my time of need, for mercy and grace. But if you find that you fall because you weren't bearing fruit, ask God for grace. And if you overcome in that situation, that's great. If you don't, it's still okay. Now, what happens after you fell into that temptation? The power of the temptation is gone. What will you do next? John chapter 15. Let's look at this. Another picture I'll give you is that you were in that moment of temptation and found that you were a branch all by yourself, not bearing fruit. So you quick try to attach yourself to the vine and it doesn't work. I've tried that. But what does he say we should do? John 15 verse 4. Abide. It's not a word we use very often. But it means just stay. Don't frantically run. It's not a run to me that he's talking about in John 15 by which we bear fruit. That you can read about in Hebrews 4. But if the run, run to you, like I said, please run to the throne of grace, the throne of mercy, and he will give you help in time of need. Trust him. But if you find that you still fail, God may be, God is trying to teach you something else. The long-term lesson. And he's willing to allow you to fall in that moment, even into sin, if he can accomplish his righteousness in you. I've come to see the reality of that truth so clearly in my own life. It's the experience of my life. I'll tell you that. 
that for years I would struggle and struggle and struggle and fight and fall and fall. And God used that to bring me to an end of myself. And now I just want to abide in him. Verse 4, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him. He bears much fruit. At the time. When the season or out of season. He'll bear fruit. She'll bear fruit. So not knowing which one of your child's is, children is going to test your patience today. Father, mother. Or how you're going to be sorely tried with some situation during the day. Abide in God. Abide in Jesus early in the morning and then 10 o'clock and then noon and then 2 o'clock. And if the temptation comes or doesn't come, you're abiding in him because one day the temptation will come when you least expect it. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My father is glorified by this that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. This is, we, pre, we say that we're a church that preaches discipleship. This is the secret to discipleship. Abiding in the vine, abiding in the vine. And in secret, nobody knows whether you're connected to the vine or not. You do and God does. And actually the devil knows too. He is a master at observing your behavior, your conduct, your habits. And by that he knows whether you're con connected or not. And he knows that when he brings a temptation, he's going to have his way with you because you're not connected. But deal with those things that prevent you from being connected. Deal with that bitterness, brother, sister. Deal with that jealousy, brother, sister. Deal with that love of money, that lust, that anger, that bitterness, whatever it might be. Deal with it. Abide in the vine. And you will bear fruit. You won't overcome sin by attaching yourself to the vine only in the moment of temptation. But you will bear fruit if you're abiding in the vine. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, be immersed in these things. Absorbed, the New American says. Immersed. I want to show you a quick picture. Here's a, this is the moment of temptation. And I'm expecting to get fruit out of this little sponge ball. And I squeeze it. Oh, battling lust, battling anger, wanting patience to come out, and it's like nothing. And then there's a picture of another cup that's soaked. And it's soaking, and it's immersed in Jesus, abiding, abiding. It's at rest. The temptation hasn't come yet, but it's coming. Late at night, you're falling to bed, no temptation. Everything's good. Had a good day. Made enough money to make it through. The bills are good. What are you doing? Are you thinking about how much more money you'll make? Or are you abiding? You wake up in the morning. Go about your day. Are you abiding? Abiding. Abiding. All of a sudden, the devil goes to God and says, I want to send a temptation to Santosh's life. God says, okay. You know, he has to ask permission for it. Learn that from the book of Job. And the devil picks you out of this abiding as it were and you feel lonely and you feel lost. And God says, I'm coming looking for fruit. I'm hungry. Show me that something's going to come out of it. And it's like the wine of the new covenant. I didn't bring the wine actually. You get the picture. He'll do it. Abide in him. I'll end with this. It's very important. That's why I don't want to leave it out. Mark chapter 11. Go back there. What shall we do? What does it mean to abide? Mark 11. We read first of all, in verse 25, I read this already, forgive. That's where it starts. If you're looking to abide, but you have something in your heart towards anybody, I don't care if they have molested your children, I don't care if they have spoken evil about you, I don't care if they have murdered a relative of yours, I, I'm trying to think of the worst possible things. 
Because none of us, I think, has experienced anything like that. We've experienced some lower degree of hate or bitterness or anger directed towards us. But forgive. Whenever you stand praying, saying, Lord, I want to abide in you. This is 7 o'clock in the morning or 6 o'clock in the morning. I'm getting up. And I stand up out of my bed and I'm praying. And the first thing God says, is there anything in your heart towards anybody, even one person in the world? Forgive. Let it go. Don't judge. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to hang out with them, spend time with them. It doesn't mean you have to invite that person, no matter what he did. Like I said, if it's a child molester or a, or a murderer or a, an evil speaker, they're all in the same category. Read the book of Revelation. You don't have to hang out with them. You don't have to spend time with them. But forgive. Forgive. Let there be nothing in your heart towards anybody. Anybody at all. Forgive. Because if you don't forgive, verse 26, neither will your Father who is heaven in heaven forgive your transgression it's a life of freedom to forgive secondly speak to that mountain that's standing in your way that mountain of lust that mountain of impatience that mountain of bitterness that mountain of hurt in the name of Jesus you will be removed speak a word of faith I mean, what good is a billion dollar jet going to do to you or a million dollars in your bank account but that mountain God will hold it to account in your life when you stand before him. So speak a word of faith. And that's the word of faith that you can absolutely be certain God will do in your life. Speak a word of faith to condemn that bad tree. Say, Lord Jesus, come and root out this fig tree that's never borne fruit in me. This old santosh that's only bearing leaves but no fruit. And then these three steps. If you've done those two, pray, believe, Receive.